Good morning, David Julin here, pastor at First Baptist Cramerton, bringing you our Sunday morning sermon for Sunday, April 25th, 2021, year of our Lord, 2021. I would like to uh, begin with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you that you can see us in all our sin, in all our desire, Yet you look at us with eyes of compassion and mercy and grace. And Lord, thank you for that. Thank you that you can not only see us, you can see who we are, all we've ever done, but you can also see what we can become. Lord, help us to respond to that so that we may see thee more clearly through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, forgive us of our sin. In Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our scripture text for today comes from the 13th chapter of Luke, the Gospel of Luke. If you want to turn to that chapter while we are, as we begin. Uh, this story is unique to you, Luke. It is not included in Matthew, Mark, or John. Um, and Jesus is in a synagogue. So let's begin in verse 10 of chapter 13. Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And just then there appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and was quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, Woman, you are set free from your ailment. When he laid hands on her, immediately she stood up straight and began praising God. But the leader of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had cured on the Sabbath, kept saying to the crowd, There are six days on which this work ought to be done. Come on these days and be cured, and not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to give it water? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 long years, be set free from this bondage on the Sabbath day? When he said this, all his opponents were put to shame, and the entire crowd was rejoicing at all the wonderful things that he was doing. You know, here I notice that Jesus observes people that other people miss, that other people overlook or are blind to. It makes me think of Zacchaeus, where everybody else is focused on other things, but Jesus, with the eyes of God, looks around and sees a man setting up in a tree and sees something in him that indicates to Jesus that he's a, he's a seeker that, or that's something that he's in need. He's, he's open. We think of the woman who is at the temple who in the midst of all the other people giving money and making great noise and show because of the large amounts they're giving, the woman that gives two tiny pennies, so to speak. And Jesus notices her, and he says, she gave out of all she had. Others give up out of their abundance. She gives out of all that she has. Here he observes a woman stooped over. This woman has come to the synagogue to worship, and he sees her. Maybe other people all around are observing other things going on, but Jesus sees her. His eyes are drawn to her. Are your eyes drawn to people? Perhaps. Are they drawn to people who other people have overlooked? Maybe there's something about this person that 
God can use. There are gifts that are latent, that are buried there, that you see them. Maybe there's a need. Maybe you're able to see them and what they really need. We can pray for God to open our eyes to see people that we have overlooked. Maybe these are even people that are all around you in your family or people right there that you've begun to overlook because we get so busy in what we're doing. Remember, for Jesus, people are the most important treasures in life. They are treasures in heaven. The only thing that goes to heaven, as far as I know, are people, as I've said so often. Now, there are two, side, two parts to this story. There is the healing part that Jesus sees the woman and heals the woman, and there's also the confrontation part. What we find first is that Jesus is at the synagogue. Now, Jesus is often found in the Gospels at the synagogues, worshiping, teaching, healing, being a part of the fellowship and the community. You know, if it's important for Jesus to be there worshiping, I think it could be important for us. It also means that people are important to Jesus because Jesus comes and interacts with the people there. At the heart of Jesus is compassion. I think if you look at the New Testament, you can say that Jesus is love. God is love. You cannot say, for example, that God is God is wrath. Wrath is a part of God and God's love, but God's love is what makes him his essence. The essence of God is love. The essence of Jesus is compassion. And he puts his hands on her and heals her. I would like to say to you that this interaction that Jesus had, you normally have to be pretty involved with people in order to help them. We are not like Jesus that we can go from town to town and just say, here we are, healed, healed. You know, like you're throwing seed out and go from one place to the next. Uh, Jesus reaches his hands out and puts them on her. This healing then brings great joy. But we also see it elicits condemnation from some. You know, that's a lot how Jesus works. Many people are overjoyed, but others are resentful. When Jesus helps and heals, and that can be the same for us, that when we do some things that we feel like are helpful to others, they may, not, not everybody's probably going to be happy. There may be some that resent it. You're not doing it the right way. You need to do it differently. You, the, you see, the religious leaders they are saying that by your healing on the Sabbath, that you are causing an affront to God. Now, that's hard for us to understand. It's hard for me to understand, even after all these years of studying this. It's an affront to God. On the Sabbath, the restrictions of what you cannot do on the Sabbath had developed, had grown up to such an extent that even doing something like this was seen in affront to God. Now, I wonder, I imagine, I've heard it said, that perhaps Jesus' healing and teaching ministry was seen as work. And that healing of the woman, if they're looking to try to catch him, you know, that healing was seen as work on the Sabbath. Well, we don't know, but we do know that he is confronted by the religious leaders. And what does Jesus do? Does he stalk off? No. He cites scripture. Jesus are arguments from scripture. He said, here I am, I've healed this woman who's been crippled for 18 years. Somebody must have been a, a witness here to know that it had been that long. And then what he does, he does what was a common argument in that time. He argue, argues, uh, it's a religious argument, from the lesser to the greater. He says, do not the scriptures say that if you have an ox or a donkey, that you can untie them and walk them to water or feed them, right? You can do that. 
And everybody says, yes, you can do that on the Sabbath. Those animals, um, they need that. They need that nourishment. They need that, that water or that food on the Sabbath. You can do that. Scripture permits that. Yet I have loosed this woman from a crippling disease. Is she not as important as a donkey or an ox? Is this daughter of Abraham not as important as a donkey or an ox that I have loosed her from what bound her and crippled her? And then he calls them hypocrites. He calls them hypocrites. Mm. That would be, in my mind, a horrible thing to, to be called a hypocrite by Jesus. I do think it's true. Sometimes religion can get off base. I'm saying religion. Rituals, sometimes the idea of having to follow certain regulations or rules um, that perhaps, if we're not careful, can obscure what God is doing in our lives. We don't need to be more concerned with rules than souls. Now, I don't think, I'm not saying that religious doctrine and observations have no place. But what I'm saying is that over and over, Jesus said that people are created in God's image and they are the most important. Remember what he said another time when he had a confrontation? Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, Sabbath was never intended to be something that crippled men, that began to uh, restrict them from uh, God's healing purposes and power. Sabbath was a wonderful thing. Sabbath was Saturday. It was brought into the world to give a man a rest and a, a way to put him properly uh, to focus on what God's real, where all his gifts come from, his gifts of love. And, 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 and we, all, we, need, we need rituals and we need the ability to uh, habits in order to be able to see God. But what had happened was many of the rituals and the regulations were no longer um, helping. They were, in fact, hurting. We don't want to become like the Pharisees and the religious leaders because, you know what, sometimes people are helped and they're helped by, um, by things that, that we would not choose. I cannot tell you in my career how many times, you know, there's a certain church that people say or a certain ministry that people say, well, that, that, that person doesn't preach the gospel or that person doesn't, they, they do, there's something bad about those people. But quite often, too, I come across people who say that this church helped me. You know, not long ago, I was talking to a man who there's a, a very large church around here that I sometimes hear people saying, oh, they don't preach the gospel and things like that. But this man said, you know what? My wife, my daughter has been in a small group there and, um, and she has, oh, her, her life has been changed. That was Elevation Church, Elevation Church. Listen, um, they, Gospel, the gospel, God works through all of us who are sinful people. Uh, no church is perfect. And that doesn't mean that we should not care what happens and care what we teach. Um, but the idea that God can work through many different, many different churches and many different people is, is really important. What is bending down or disfiguring you? What is breaking you down weighing down your soul. Well, the first thing that comes to my mind is sin. That may not be what everybody thinks about primarily, currently, um, first today, but sin. Sin can cause our lives to be marred, to be disfigured, to be crippled. The sins of pride, the sins of anger, Paul talks about in the book of Galatians that we're studying on Wednesday night, the works of the flesh, sexual immorality, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, envy, and drunkenness, uh, and, and on and on. All these things can bend us down, can cripple us. Sin can do that. Sins of, as the scriptures, as the church used to say, sins of commission, committing sins, transgressions, 
sins of omission, sins of when we see the right thing to do, but we don't do it. We leave the person beside the side of the road like in the Good Samaritan. All these things can cripple us spiritually, their sin. I think another thing that can really cripple us is shame. Shame can cause us to be bent and broken down in our soul. You know, some of my work with, with those in addiction, one of the things that I have discovered through uh, people teaching me and telling me is that, you know, oftentimes when people get sober, we think that's the end of it. When they get sober from drugs or alcohol or whatever. But what happens is when they get sober, all of a sudden they have to begin to face many of the things that they have done. And they don't have the way to, uh, to cushion the blow, to, to, um, to numb themselves with substances. And so they're really having to face all these things that they've done in their addiction. And what happens is sometimes they go back to the substance abuse because they can't face what they've done. That's why it's so important to have love as a part of helping people when they deal with addictions. There needs to be boundaries, yes. There needs to be things that are done to guide and help and even protect the family. However, love is also very important in dealing with those who are in recovery. To let them know they are loved like Jesus loves them despite what they've done. You see, Jesus' radical love and willingness to confront where society and religious uh, leaders caused confrontation. Following Christ may get you into trouble. Sometimes following Christ may bring a crisis. Now, the people celebrated when Jesus was healed. The woman celebrated when she was healed. You know, she didn't worry about what the Pharisees said. She was like, I'm so happy. It says she worshiped God. That's the appropriate response when something good comes into our life, when we're blessed by God. We, we worship. I want you to notice, though, that the woman did not have to be healed in order to worship. She was worshiping despite being bent and disfigured and stooped over before Jesus healed her. She was worshiping before Jesus healed her. You see, she knew God was worthy in her illness with her crippling condition as worthy as he was after she was healed. Jesus straightens her up and then her eyes are lifted up rather than being focused down only on the ground. Her eyes are lifted up and she's able to see. What a wonderful picture that would be, wouldn't it? What a wonderful picture. In the Bible, often the phrase, lift up your eyes, or lift up your eyes to see what God is doing. We can be bent down under the burden of sin and the busyness of life where we bend our own self down. We're not able to see what God is doing around us. In Isaiah 40, lift up your eyes and behold the creation who created these things. God did. Lift up your eyes, Jesus said in John, for the fields are white for harvest. Church, the fields are still white for harvest. We need to be able to be workers that are willing to go out and help those in need, to preach and teach the gospel, to say that Jesus loves us, that we need to be saved. Lift up your eyes because they will come, the prophet says in Isaiah 60, they will come from far away. We look to the day when God's people will come together when there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. That's part of our teaching. And we can begin to see that now, the reconciliation. Where are the people in need around you? 
Will you pray, God, let me see them? And what I often find is when we are in despair and in need, and but when we begin to help others, we begin to be helped too. Where are the people in despair? Where are the people with potential that are on the sidelines that you can say, look, look how God can help us. And look how God can, can use this person. You begin to see them with God's eyes. Lord, open our eyes. Open our eyes. Lord, help us to see in our own lives what is bending us, what is crippling us, what is, what is pushing us down. And help us to cooperate with you, Lord, in our willingness. It's, it's sin. Convict us of our sin, Lord. Admit our sin to you. And if we need to, admit it to others. Help us to cooperate with you to be removed from the sinful unhealthy thinking that cripples us. Lord, lift up our eyes. Lift up our eyes and help us to see Jesus. Lord, lift up our eyes. Bring us closer to thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Listen, God bless you, and I sure hope to see you soon. Lift up your eyes this week to see who God has put in your path. God bless you.